a chasing predator, though I'm of going to be an active forager predator. Um, but it's also recommended, it's also, it's been stated that they have the longest fangs out of any recorded snake. So they haven't really gone out and measured every single snake species fang. So it's a bit disputed if they have the longest fangs or not. But they have measured them up to about an inch and a half, almost two inches too. And as I told you previously before too, if their striking speed is very remarkably fast. Um, and of course, with the whole counterbalancing in too as well, they usually pride themselves on accuracy when they actually bite into something. Um, they have a really cool behavior too when actually they grab onto things, but you can see when Jim actually extracts them, he's placing them down this kind of mat and he's using the hook to properly pin them that we can enact a walking hole. So that's safe for his fingers, the mat actually helps distribute pressure evenly so the animal is not taking the full brunt force of this way. It's not hurting or damaging them. But these guys never really get used to trying to extract them, so it's not simply like, oh well, I can figure out this, this is perfectly fine once I get used to it, they're not habituated to this in a single way. Like I told you guys earlier in the video, you're also snakes view everything bigger than them as a potential threat or as a potential predator. So even though Jim's done this a couple of times with these animals, and even though he's been working with snakes for about nearly 48 years, they never really get used to a big old hand grabbing them and picking them up. Because to put it into perspective for you, it'd be like if you were sitting in your home, you know, you're sitting there for a couple of times on end in your favorite spot watching TV, eating your favorite food, and all of a sudden a big hand lifts up your roof. And, Perhaps probably not going to look forward to that every time it's probably going to happen, which we don't extract from any of our snake species every single day. For each singular species we extract from, depending upon the purpose and depending upon who we're partnered with, the reason why we're extracting from them is going to vary um, how many times we extract from them. So um, for something like a Western Diamondback, it's going to be. Since Jim is actually laying his hands on these animals, of course he is having the, um, more, the most risky um, interaction with them. Since he's the only one who extracts from these animals, he's the one who does this entire process. And like I talked about earlier on, when he's putting their heads through, especially when he's interlocking that finger placement, especially important with any venomous snake species, mind you. Um, but for this species, since these guys have those long fangs, since their mouths are very pliable, it's very flexible, they can actually occasionally will slip a fang across a closed mouth, and if they feel like their mouth is much so sealed, they can actually put their fangs straight to the bottom of their mouth to try and get you to it. Um, because it's to them it's life or death. Like I said, yeah. big Godzilla-sized animal picking you up, and it's going to frighten the heck out of them. I um, mean, different snakes have different self mechanisms. Um, they can also must from time to time, or so they really sell their food. And like I said, they stockpile food for a minute, so when it all comes out, it's kind of like a uh, flood. <laughs> but <laughs> or they right. wait until you change their bedding, and then they do that. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> like the black mama, like the uh, crickets over here. Yeah, absolutely. Do you guys have any questions about these guys so far? Or about the process so far too? And when he's bringing them up to the funnel, you can see with his fingers, he's actually massaging the top of their heads and running his fingers along there. He's inducing contractions of the venom glands. So whenever a venomous snake bites something, of course, there's regular natural muscle movements that reinforce the muscle and the venom glands to react and really spin them into the fangs and put venom out. So that's what he's motivating. He's not bringing these snakes out like a wet rag. Um, he's not trying to get every single drop, he's only working with what they want to give him. So if he feels the snake tense up, if he feels like the snake is in the middle of it's going down and decreasing, he'll stop extracting from the animal and put them back into their habitat. So, I'll show you guys the What she's talking about is at times too when he extracts from these animals, they'll occasionally shed a thing. Okay. Um, so these animals will actually replace their teeth throughout their entire lifespan as they go on and on and on. Um, throughout the endurance. See, they aren't like a shark, where they have rows and rows of claws and teeth that just slip in like a conveyor belt. Whenever a tooth is getting older, loose, or whenever it gets knocked apart or anything like that or damaged, a new fang will start piling in behind it and push it out. And these guys, from time to time, too, when they bite onto a potential prey animal, or in this case, when they're on top of the funnel, the fang will slip out and just simply part ways, and they already have a new fang ready to go and they're really used to. It. Um, when, we, when a shed fang usually occurs, like if we get a shed fang on the phone or anything like that, we usually will spray it out with the bleach. That way it cancels the effects of if there's any remaining venom presence there. So of course, to any slight cut or any slight stab, we will put them on a hook. It's kind of some of the animation of the truth, or even a slight scratch with that still on the tip. Yeah. yeah. They also, at times when they shed their fangs, when they bite, especially for the boon vipers, like I said, that are very sedentary, um, they're ambush pairs that will reserve the spot themselves in one spot. They'll actually take in a lot of shed fangs. Like they'll bite something, the fang will come the prey animal, they'll swallow and consume the prey animal, and they'll release it eventually. And when that happens, like I said, when they poop, they poop a 
lot and get a good couple of shed fangs in that group sample too. Mm -hmm. um, so if you see all the shed fang necklaces that you see up in the gift shop, those are made by Arlene Keeper because she's phenomenally artistic and wonderful. Um, it's kind of like digging for gold in a very poopy, messy way. And so you'll usually flip over their big poop piles and you'll see a good few fangs in the two as well. I think the most amount that I've ever seen come out of a single baboon poop was about also see um, this little extension is one of why they're called Fittus rhinoceros is for the little scale extensions that they have on the nasal lip right on top of their noses. It actually helps them blend in. Um, it also is believed to as well when rain comes down, this fur is actually um, like the water slide into their mouth. Since when it, it's very typical in the animal kingdom for any species to not really issue stagnant standing pools of water with no movement at all is a viable source of drinking. Because stagnant pools are usually attributed to bacteria, parasitic infections. Um, or over in Africa, especially too, a place where you can get ambushed by something like a crocodile. So moving river systems, which of course moving river systems are also attributed to that, is thought to be a lot cleaner. So these guys will usually intake a lot of their hydration, not to just what they want to eat, or what they eat, but also when the rain falls. Um, one of the coolest facts I can tell you about them too is that coloration that you see on their heads, that black coloration, it's called super black. And um, it's hydrophobic, if you know what that means. Um, whenever it rains down, or we get any water on it, their skin and the scales, they don't want to get wet. Um, that super black is supposed to mimic the shadows of what they usually reside in from trees, so when sunlight penetrates through like a forest, you'll see all the shade that you actually get them out. That's where they specialize in their high wind that's where they specialize in their camouflage. So, of course, when you're looking at a shadow, it doesn't have stain in the body, so it's staying droplets of water. Yeah. And uh, for something you dig, it's probably a little bit harder to recognize right out of the way, which they're not trying to give up to like an antelope or a gazelle. They're going after rodents that are also very good.